This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include former Supreme Court Justice Bob Orr. Welcome back. John Hood from the John Locke Foundation. Chris Fitzsimon, the bearded one from NC Policy Watch. And former Secretary of State, former Attorney General Rufus Edmiston. Well, we don't know all of what 2014 is going to produce, but we do know the state of North Carolina is going to be spending a lot of time in courtrooms because of the many lawsuits in which the state is involved. We want to acquaint you with some of the more prominent suits and get our panel to comment on what we might expect. Well, 2014 is an election year, and several efforts are afoot to interrupt or alter those elections. In one suit, the NAACP and others are suing to declare the legislative districts declared unconstitutional because they divide voters along racial lines. They ask the courts to delay the filing period for candidates, which begins in just a few days, but the court refused. Another suit involves the voter ID law, or several suits. The NAACP and ACLU are suing, saying the laws violate the Voting Rights Act and claim to suppress African-American voters. Bob Orr, let's begin this discussion with the Constitution. Article 6, Sections 1 and 2 prescribe that any person who's a naturalized citizen, 18 years of age or older, has lived in our state for a year, has uh, in a a specific precinct for the past 30 days, is eligible to vote. It then delegates to the legislature the power to set any other specifics regarding the elections. So are these lawsuits based on the plaintiffs not believing the legislature has the authority to make these decisions? Um, that the decisions violate the Federal Voting Rights Act laws, or what? Well, I think the plaintiffs believe that the legislation in question violated, one, the state constitution, that's being litigated in state court, and it also violated the Voting Rights Act and federal constitutional provisions, and, and that's being litigated in federal court. But the provisions you noted set out the qualifications under the Constitution for someone to be eligible to vote in North Carolina. And I think the authority is is pretty well established that the legislature has no authority to add or take away any of those eligibility. Qual- yes, yeah. eligibility okay. questions. But as far as being able to provide uh, requirements legislatively for registration and how you verify at the polls and how you vote, it. where you vote, that, when you vote, right. those types of things. Right. That, that's not a qualification. And so the issue in the case uh, in state court is, uh, is the legislation an additional qualification or not? Chris, the, the Supreme Court refused to issue an injunction to delay the uh, filing period and the elections. But they didn't give any reasons for refusing to do so. Is that unusual? Was that a surprise? No, I think, I mean, uh, I would defer to the former justice, but there's a lot of times when a court makes a decision and doesn't explain it uh, uh, in the, as, a, as a case going along. What I find the most fascinating in the redistricting case is whether or not uh, they'll, the, uh, the, the emails and the communications will be actually will I, I be wanted to get I think on, that's a I, fascinating topic. How does, how does the legislature claim immunity from all of this? Well, they have, uh, the, they, uh, what's striking to me is the immunity of people who aren't covered by the, who are the, the correspondence between, uh, the, to show the legislative intent. I think that's a stretch there, that that is not relevant to the case. I think that's, that's going to be one of the most important decisions the court has to make. Actually. Well, relevance shouldn't make any difference, should it? I mean, this is a, uh, uh, under the open meetings law and public uh, well, documents in North Carolina, Bob. Should, legislators, communication between legislators now are protected under the open meetings. Bob, language. why should that be? Why are they any different than, say, the administration? Or uh, under public records, they write the law, so they write whatever <laughs> exceptions they want into it. I mean, that's that's just the reality of it. Uh, they, they win. Yeah. The the, the uh, question I wanted to ask was about uh, the Supreme Court now says they're not going to delay these. Uh, uh, primary filings, not going to delay the primary elections. Uh, We've had the Federal Justice Department say that these districts that the legislature created do not violate the Voting Rights Act. We had a three-judge North Carolina panel uh, concur with that. Uh, John, is that pretty conclusive uh, evidence uh, that these laws, these districts are probably going to pass and be upheld? 
The chances of the plaintiffs winning the redistricting litigation, is they are very low. You couldn't say zero, but they're very low. But the litigation about voter ID and early voting that's going on in federal court, state court, some of the federal court uh, decisions about Voting Rights Act and what is called retrogression have been conflicted. And there is some, I, d I doubt those suits will work also, but there is a reasonable chance they are unlike with the redistricting. We need a different system. We need to draw districts differently. We need to have reform. I don't think you're going to get it through litigation at this point. Rufus, let's go to the lawsuits. A federal judge said there's not going to be any trials on these lawsuits until uh, July 15, 2015, because it would take both the plaintiffs and the state that long to be able to assemble the evidence and prepare their cases and so forth like that. But Judge Joy Peek also said that she'd be willing to hear uh, some pleadings to place an injunction on parts of the law prior to this year's uh, election and keep it from going into effect until after the tri until after the trial. Tell us where things stand so far as uh, people trying to get injunctions to stop these uh, voting rights well, act. Well, <clears throat> this this kind of thing has happened before. I recall some when I was attorney general. We put off an election one time to way up in the fall or the late summer, and uh, I, I'm going to tell you that no matter what they're doing, I, I'm going to concur with John here. The plaintiffs have to prove that there was almost insidious attempt to uh, deny the, the votes to, say, African Americans. Uh, I, I think that that's not going to be an issue. I think some of the other things, that are, I think there are four things in this so suit that came up. Uh, early voting, uh, where you lose your right to vote if you go to a wrong precinct. Now, that just seems to me ridiculous that you, that you can't go back and vote on that. that that's limiting a vote, and that's messing, in my opinion, uh, Justice Orr, with that provision that you talked but about. But eliminating straight ticket voting? Uh, I, no, I don't think that rises to that level, but what, yeah. what you've got is that they're not going to stop this process. Uh, the elections will go on just like they were, and somewhere down when heaven falls out, There'll be a decision that won't make, that won't make any difference because it's all over with. I'd like to get a quick reaction from all of you on this as, as a final note on this particular topic. If I'm a if I'm a listener hearing all of this discussion, here's sort of what I'm getting from this. When the Democrats were in charge of state government, they passed laws that made it easier for their supporters to go to the polls and vote. Now Republicans are in charge. And they are changing the laws to benefit their constituents. Isn't that really what we're talking about here, Chris? Well, except for the Democrats are trying to make it easier for people to vote. The Republicans are trying to make well, it more difficult. Easier for their people well, no, to for vote. everybody to vote. Well, no, their well, people no, everybody, particular. Well, but everybody to vote. That's the, that's the fundamental difference. Well, okay. well, the interesting legal question about that is once you've expanded the liberality of people voting, can the General Assembly come back and, and take contract it, it? I mean, if early voting had been four months, and the Republicans came in and said, let's make it two months, is that now unconstitutional? I doubt it. Reaction, Rufus, that, John. That, that's, exa that's the key issue with the election law lawsuit, particularly in federal court, is this issue of once you've done something, can you take it back if there's a disparate impact? I think it's a pretty difficult argument for them to win, but it's probably a more reasonable argument than they've got on the redistricting. Well, this, it's a high burden to pass. And at the same time, though, uh, when I was Attorney General, I mean Secretary of State, every Secretary of State in the nation was told, both Republican and Democrat, your job is to see that more people vote. And that's why I'm, I'm a little bit baffled by the whole thing. I want to remind you, NC Spin is now available on most Time Warner cable systems throughout the state. You can find out the channel numbers and times by visiting our website, ncspin.com. But you can also watch the show or any recent episode by visiting ncspin.com and clicking on the box on the right-hand side of the page, we post each week's show on Friday. When you visit ncspend.com, read our weekly column along with columns from across the state. And uh, these panelists particularly, give us your opinions. We want to hear yours. Don't forget you can find NC Spend on Facebook or at NC Spend Tweets. We look forward to hearing from you. After these messages, an education lawsuit discussion. NC Spin will return after these messages. Fishing isn't just part of my job, it's my life. It's a part of who I am and how I was raised in Eastern North Carolina. It's how I put food on the table for my family. 
It's hard work, but I love what I do. There's something special about knowing that my long, hard days help feed friends, neighbors, and people in North Carolina. It might not be glamorous, but fishing is my life. The cost of everything has gone up dramatically over the last 75 years. With one exception. Keeping electricity affordable. That's the power of your co-op membership. Learn more at TogetherWeSave.com. North Carolina's Touchstone Energy Cooperatives. Looking out for you. We now return to NC Spin. Last year's legislature initiated a program of vouchers for lower income parents for their students to attend private schools, but the NCAE and others want the courts to declare these vouchers unconstitutional. The group of teachers also and school boards have filed suits saying the law ending career status or teacher tenure is unconstitutional. Several lawsuits going on there. Rufus, let's begin with the lawsuit over the vouchers. The plaintiffs say this law is unconstitutional on several grounds. They cite the Constitution provision that funds will be used only for free public education. They say this new law provides public funds for private purposes in violation of the Constitution. And they say it doesn't require any accountability or requirement students actually receive the sound basic education. Roy Cooper, our Attorney General, is going to have to defend this suit. You were our AG for many years. How would you defend it? Well, you put me on the spot. Uh, first of all, you, you have to realize that the voucher system is new to North Carolina. Everybody's all upset about it. But at the same time, we've been doing things like that for a long time. If you think about the private schools and universities getting a tuition grant. I mean, come on. That, that's been going on for years. So if I were arguing, I would use that. And, and I would also say that the legislature uh, has great deference. You, you, as, as Bob knows, you give great deference to the legislature. Uh, and. The, the whole question of this is, are you really violating that constitutional provision that says you shall have a public education? And are you, I think you get very, very murky when you start giving money to private organizations. But my argument would be that you're giving them not to them, but you're giving them to the parents. All right, Bob, I think Rufus has, has put his hand on the key point uh, in this discussion, and that is only provide money for free public education, public schools. And as he said, the legislative tuition grant that we're giving to private colleges in North Carolina clearly violates that principle, well, or it seems I, to. I would say there's a distinction Thank there. You. First, uh, you have a specific state constitutional provision that, that requires the General Assembly to use tax dollars exclusively for the uh, public school system, K the free public school okay. system. Yes, mm -hmm. and so I think that's clearly uh, distinguishable from the higher education issue. And uh, actually, the voucher program, not terribly dissimilar to this one, was tried and required to have a constitutional amendment back in the 50s. It was called the Pearsall Amendment, yes. and it was to provide vouchers to private schools for children who didn't want to go to integrated Basically schools. Basically separate but equal yes, education. Yes, and it was yes. struck down yeah. as unconstitutional, right. but it was required to have a constitutional amendment. John, I want to get to this public money for private purposes. I mean, we've had lots of discussions about this through the years on NC Spend, but the courts have pretty much ruled you can use pu public monies for darn near anything you want to, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, th this is actually a public purpose. I mean, we've, we've had des decisions in the past that were pr pretty hard to see that it was a public purpose, and yet they did it anyway. In this case, it isn't any different from public money being used for hospitals owned by the Catholics or public money being used for private colleges. Remember, Smart Start and, and North Carolina Pre-K regularly devote yes. millions of dollars a year to, private, to carry out a public right. purpose, but they use private providers of the service, this is very difficult to right, win. Chris, I want to close this topic by, by getting to this uh, uh, teacher tenure, career status thing. Uh, on what basis are NCAE and other groups... That they're, losing, that they're losing something they had, that they're losing a protection, that they're losing, in effect, property, they're losing their contract 
uh, but I have to I have to <laughs> jump in on the voucher thing. I think that I don't know whether it's the best legal case, but the fact that it's <clears throat> an unaccountable education and then the sound basic education is required is fascinating because there's compelling evidence that a lot of these schools don't provide a sound basic education. They're are virtually unregulated. They're uninspected. They teach things that the taxpayers have no control over, which I would argue, nobody listening would think would be a sound basic education. And starting next year, they're going to get our money. Of course, I well, think there would be people that would say some of our public schools aren't. But we have a say either. in our public yeah. schools, and we but, elect our school board. We don't right. elect the people to run these schools. Oh, it's totally we're, different. We're going to come totally back and, and talk some more about some of these lawsuits, particularly the lawsuit on NC Tracks after these messages. NC Spin will return after these messages. You trust your family physician to care for you and your family. We treasure that trust and are committed to providing the best care possible for all North Carolinians. It's time for Medicaid reform, but not without input from North Carolina's family physicians. Medicaid reform will impact health care for all of us. Tell state leaders you want your physician involved. We need Medicaid reform that's good for North Carolina. To sign our petition of support, visit rnchealthcare.com. With over 30 years of catering experience in the Triangle, why not bring the innovative style of the Irregardless Cafe and Catering to your next event? Our event specialists can assist with the planning of business meetings, cocktail parties, and sit-down meals for receptions and gatherings. We do it all. For your next event and special occasion, contact Irregardless Cafe and Catering. We now return to NC Spin. All right, I got to tell you, when we went to the break, the whole panel just rose up and said, hey, we hadn't finished this. The, the lawsuits on education could be a game changer in education. So we're going we're gonna to go back in and open this subject back up. Bon, Bob, what was the comment that you were making? Well, the point is, even if the voucher system is constitutional, there's a major question out there about which Chris raised in part, and that is, are there constitutional responsibilities on the private schools both as to the quality of the education they provide if they're using public money and to a non-discriminatory policy of admission uh, if they're going to take but, public But, John, money. wouldn't that be the case anyway? I mean, don't these private schools, uh, students have to take the same end-of-grade test? No, and, no, no, they do not have to take this, but they have to give a test. And there are already regulations even the before the voucher test. Is prescribed. Test. It just says any national test. That's correct. All of them, which would be better than the it North could be, Carolina it could be, You could start a test tomorrow, the ACME <laughs> test, and that would qualify uh -huh. under the law. How well, many private schools give tests that are better than right, the Let's don't get, let's don't get sidetracked. Rufus. Well, let, let's talk about the Leandro case. If you take that case, they say you... Judge Manning has said you've got to have certain criteria. So if that's the case with Leandro, you've got to have the same thing with these private schools that get public money. And, but that's the question. But, yeah, Are they bound by the Leandro or at, not? If you look at what has yeah, happened yeah. in other states where the same argument has been made, most of the time, there has been a couple of cases where it worked, but most of the time it doesn't work. And the reason is other courts have interpreted that uniform provision type of uh, clause to mean that you have to provide the opportunity for public education for all students. And you can also do other things. And if you had a voucher system that, de and you did that instead of providing public schools, that would clearly violate the if Constitution. If it was a mandatory voucher. But if it's supplemental to right. what is already offered, it's very unlikely this argument is going to work. I'm just telling you. All right. It worked in I, wanna, Florida. I do want us to go to the next to uh, topic. <laughs> A group of doctors is suing the state, several vendors and consultants over the poor performance of the NC Tracks Medicaid claim software system. They say the lack of payment is damaging their medical practices, causing harm to patients, and the computer program went live, or tried to in July, years later than projected, millions of dollars over budget. John, the doctors say they've had to hire extra people uh, to d deal with the claims problems, had to borrow money to keep their practices afloat, and in some instances lay off people, all of which they say has caused harm to their patients. If they prevail, this could be an expensive payout. What's your assessment of this NC Tracks lawsuit? Well, it lawsuit? could be an expensive payout, but the attorneys that I talked to, because I haven't been following this issue very well at all legal, on the legal side, and they don't think this is very likely to succeed. Uh, the state makes all sorts of decisions that affect private interests, pro or con. In this case, it's important that they were emphasizing that their patients were harmed because the Medicaid system does not exist to serve doctors. You see, right. it exists to serve patients, doctors and the means to that end. So they have to argue that. They have to argue 
uh, a fairly, they have to meet a fairly high standard to establish that this is not just a screw up, which it clearly was, but is actionable against the state. Well, in all cases, as Justice Orr will tell you, you have to show damages. You don't get, get a, a ruling saying oh, you, you were harmed. And well, wait a minute. You don't think it. that pay, well, withholding well, payment well, on Medicaid? Well, I'm saying that they have to be provable, too. A lot of these claims may be bogus. A lot of these claims may not be right. And so I don't know how you award damage. All right. I, 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 that's specifically a question I want to ask you because uh, CSC, the company that developed this software program, is a client of yours. Correct. And, and Bob Seligson, the head of the Medical Society, said most of the blame rest on the shoulders of CSC instead of DHHS. Um, CSC says that uh, this claim is just uh, bogus. It's made out of whole cloth. Well, I, I haven't seen a, an IT initiative in, in 100 years, I've been around that long, that succeeded at first. And I'm not going to take a position on that because any, any good lawyer knows that when you have something in litigation, you shouldn't talk about it. Well, this yourself. ain't a question of not succeeding at first, is it, Chris? No, in <laughs> fact, uh, we saw recent statistics this past week that there are more than a third of, uh, of private care physicians and people that do specialty things are still not being reimbursed in a reasonable amount of time. We heard stories at the legislative building, small hospitals couldn't receive million dollars in payments for the chemotherapy drugs. All right, Bob, real quick. It's a lawsuit. It's, right, it's a raise, lawsuit. Not they a raise right. negligence. They raise breach of contract unfair and deceptive trade practice. The plaintiffs have to prove by the greater weight of the evidence right, that that in fact Here's my question happened. to you. Is this lawsuit going to get settled out of court? Probably. Probably. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> After these messages, we're going to talk about another lawsuit involving abortion, abortion protocol. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. It's true. Farming is different than it was 50 years ago. We know consumers have questions about how our food is grown today. North Carolina livestock farmers want you to know that they're using the most responsible and caring farming practices to feed our state. NCAnimalAg.com. We now return to NC Spend. Last year's legislature also passed a law saying before a doctor could perform an abortion, he or she must show the pregnant woman ultrasound images and explain to her the dimensions and qualities the ultrasound showed. Federal Judge Catherine Eagles recently ruled this law was a violation of free speech and an impermissible attempt to compel these providers to deliver the state's message in favor of childbirth and against abortion. Chris, where does this leave this new anti-abortion law passed by the legislatures? Does other parts of it uh, stay in effect? Yeah, this uh, law put a lot of restrictions on abor access to abortion services. The judge had a restraining order on the ultrasound provision, and she found that it, it was unconstitutional. Uh, Governor McCrory, I think, did the right thing recently and announced that he did not want to appeal the ruling on just the ultrasound part. The rest of it stays in place, but there's a lot of pressure from... Uh, uh, anti-choice activists and the legislative leadership to actually appeal the ruling on the ultrasound provision. Yeah, I was getting ready to say, uh, Governor McCrory has indicated, John, he's not going to appeal this decision, but a lot of the legislative leaders say that they want, they want him to do so. What do you think is going to happen? Well, they, they passed the law originally. I think they, they believe that they have a role to play in deciding that question. I think McCrory is weighing two things. Number one, he did talk about not putting additional restrictions on the, the use of abortion in North Carolina during the campaign. And I think more likely they have simply calculated this particular provision is difficult to defend. Rufus, if they do appeal and lose, where does that leave the state? Well, you pri if you're attorney general, I, in my opinion, your primary client is the legislature that passed the law. Yeah, I got that. And, and, and if they uh, appeal and lose, th th this is a no winner in my opinion. I gave a ruling one time about a, a, a tag in North Carolina that said, First and freedom. This guy didn't, wouldn't, didn't believe in it. He taped it over, and I gave a little attorney general ruling that that was unconstitutional because it made him believe the speech he didn't right. believe in. I want to get I want to get to one and more the, lawsuit before and they we upheld it. Close the show, and that's involving the election protocol. In order to clarify the the uh, uh, method for execution of death row inmates, so as not to be considered cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, Public Safety Secretary Frank Perry recently declared a new single drug, lethal injection, would be the protocol for executions. 
four death row inmates sued the state, saying that Perry didn't have the authority to make that decision. Bob Orr, uh, you are now in private practice, and you represented those four inmates. Tell us on what grounds uh, they, are, they are making this case, and if the secretary doesn't have the authority to make the decision, who does? Well, he has the legislative authority to make a protocol or to, or to produce a protocol. The question, the only question right now before the Court of Appeals is whether that execution protocol, which is like a 20-page manual that involves everything from media restrictions to medical personnel, uh, the question is, does it have to go through rulemaking? So if he doesn't have the authority to do this, who does? Well, he has the authority. It's whether it has has to go go through rulemaking. All right. He's in charge of the Department of Corrections. He can do it on his own. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Give your feedback. Read our weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. We thank you for a very good discussion this week and hope you'll come back next week when we take on more issues of interest to the people of North Carolina. Until then, stay informed and watch out for The Spin. Join us next week and get The Spin on issues facing our state.